Archaeology News, the news you can trust. For today's Archaeology News, I wanted to take a break from the usual and delve into two recent papers which feature my area of academic interest and archaeology's most powerful new tool. And both of them show that even in places we're familiar with, and in time periods we recognize, different societies took very different approaches to basic features of daily life and social organization. Right. And that tees up an archeological battle of the sexes. Because these two basic forms of social organization, they would be patrilineality versus matrilineality and patrilocality versus matrilocality. So let's start out by taking these two terms and breaking them down. Patrilocal versus matrilocal. Well, first we see the prefixes patra, matra, father, mother, followed by local, meaning location. So patrilocal would mean the newlywed couple moves in with the father's people and his place, his village, whereas matrilocal means the same, but with the mothers. Then there's patrilineal versus matrilineal. There we see the same prefixes, father, mother, followed by lineal, essentially how we trace descent. In today's society, that's sort of like whose last name do we take? For example, in most royal dynasties throughout history, when a woman ascends the throne, that leads to a change in the name of the whole dynasty. Let's take Queen Victoria of the House of Hanover. She was on the throne for more than 60 years, but when she passed away, her son Edward VII ascended. Except he took the name Saxe Coburg Gotha, which was not Victoria's last name, but that of her long deceased husband and uh, Edward's father, Prince Albert, because the royal family was then strictly patrilineal. But fun fact, Saxe Coburg Gotha didn't last long because in 1917, George V bowed to public pressure and changed the family name to Windsor, reflecting not such great optics about having a German last name in the midst of World War I. <laughs> However, although Victoria's family at the time was patrilineal, it was not patrilocal, it was matrilocal, because of course, after all, Albert came to live at Victoria's place, Buckingham Palace, with her family, rather than at Coburg. Well, because most societies today are nominally patrilineal, meaning most kids take their father's last name, and to the extent this even exists anymore, patrilocal, we tend to assume societies everywhere were always like this all the time. The man takes his woman to go live with his clan. However, not so as revealed by ancient DNA. And these two studies I'm going to discuss, both of which were published in January 2025, do focus on societies that we've dealt with to some extent. One regards Iron Age Britain, a shadowy land of myth and legend which the outside world knew little about. The people who lived there were supposedly barbarians who painted themselves and fought naked. In fact, it's believed the island's name Britain came from the word Britani, meaning the painted people or the tattooed folk. And that's a good image because it brings up another stereotype. You see, Britain, of course, was invaded by Julius Caesar, so he met these people face to face. And he was horrified by the role, the prominent role that women played in society, and even that they fought alongside their menfolk. And two historical examples of this would be Cartamandua, a treacherous uh, queen of the Brigantes, a northern British tribe, who eventually allied with Rome and betrayed her own husband, and Boudicca, Queen of the Iceni, an Eastern British tribe who rebelled against Roman authority and almost kicked the bums off the island before being defeated. The Romans saw this status of women as barbaric, just a sign of barbarians' barbariousness. 
And hence, in the later 20th century, historians have looked upon this claim by Caesar with some skepticism, thinking it just uh, something that he snuck in as a justification for his invasion of Britain, or perhaps just a misunderstanding as he didn't speak the language. Oh, no, he didn't. The second story concerns the Avars, a group of nomadic peoples from Central Asia who made it all the way to Central Europe, and they came to base themselves in what is today Hungary. Anyway, these Avars were fearsome horse-bound warriors, going so far as to push the mighty Byzantine Empire back and even besieging the capital at Constantinople. And so, like the Britons, the Avars were viewed as strange and barbarous, having odd practices like polygamy, having multiple wives. But as they left behind very few written sources and were generally stigmatized by their neighbors, not much is known about the Avars, where the truth begins and the shit talking ends. So these two studies give us the real lowdown on these two old questions, patrilineality versus matrilineality and patrilocality versus matrilocality. The first, in Iron Age Britain, is near and dear to my heart because it centers on the site where I did my very first archaeological dig, Winterbourne Kingston in Dorset, Southwest England. This is where I took my first hand at the nuts and bolts of field archaeology. The dig is part of the Durotriges project run out of Bournemouth University and has been going on for literally decades at this point. It centers on the Iron Age Durotriges, a tribe who claimed this part of southwestern England as their territory and kept their way of life for some time uh, in Roman Britain, though they eventually adopted the Roman way of life. More women! More wine! More! And what makes the Durotriges a little different from their British neighbors is they actually buried at least some of their dead, as you can see right here. During the month or so I spent there, we found three to four skeletons, but generally nowadays we don't distribute those for wide viewership out of respect for the dead. I've just shown one that has been published. And what makes this so special is that during the Iron Age in Britain, there are very, very few bodies. Most of these people didn't bury their dead, and if they cremated them, they didn't bury the cremated ashes, but probably scattered them around. We know from the many times we've talked about the subject that some of them deposited bodies in bogs, but there really aren't that many of those in Britain, so they must have done something else with the rest of them. There's some thought that the bodies were excarnated, having their flesh removed, or were otherwise destroyed or left to decay, kind of like what the Tibetans do if you've seen one of their grisly sky burials, uh, enough said. The point is, aside from Winterbourne Kingston, there aren't so many Iron Age bodies from Britain to test for ancient DNA. So what this groundbreaking study did is tested all 55 skeletons found on site for DNA, uh, and I was actually able to sequence 40 of them to the extent that you could get the identity by descent, uh, essentially the familial relationships. And to understand the gender part of it, we also have to analyze the DNA from the mitochondria versus the Y chromosomes. Now, if you recall from my episode on Y chromosomal DNA, that comes down only from the father, whereas the mitochondrial DNA found in the cell's mitochondria comes via the mother. So what they found, the Y chromosomal DNA was actually quite diverse, whereas the mitochondrial DNA flowed predominantly from a single source. And because they are able to discern the different people's relationship with each other, they were able to reconstruct a family tree which descends from a founding female. Moreover, using some fancy stats modeling in time, numbers of male versus female births, etc., the team calculated that this level of genetic diversity and the family structure would imply almost no female outmigration and a lot more of that for males, meaning males left the community. That's it, I'm out of here. Furthermore, they did kind of the same exercise with the other scattered Iron Age burials in Britain, and they found the same thing, a low level of mitochondrial DNA diversity. And comparing this along space and time, 
The researchers found that this was fairly unique to Iron Age Britain. This dynamic was not noted in the Neolithic or the Bronze Age periods. Overall levels of mitochondrial DNA diversity were much lower than in Iron Age Europe, making this a particularly British custom. So essentially, these Iron Age British families went to live with mom and they were structured around women. We always knew British women were fierce. If you wanna be my lover, you gotta get with my friends. Now the why of this is a little bit more speculative, but the thinking was that in Britain, the Iron Age was a rather chaotic time, lacking central authority and rather violent. Now this is controversial because in academia, there's been a sort of quote unquote pacification of the Iron Age but it is something that I've written a lot about, and that sort of violent, chaotic view of the Iron Age is something that I generally subscribe to. So since the men were always off fighting and getting themselves killed, the idea was that for stability's sake, the children stayed with the mom's family, and that's also how property, which in that day was probably just land and livestock, was also passed down through the mothers. Now, jumping ahead 600 years to the 7th and 8th century, the next paper focused on a few cemeteries whose names are quite a mouthful. I'll go with the two easiest that I can attempt to pronounce, uh, Lobesdorf and Mödling, uh, among some others. <laughs> These two cemeteries are located about 25 kilometers or 15 miles apart in what is today Austria. But as you know from our discussions on the Avars, the Avar heartland was in Hungary. So these uh, sites are kind of on the periphery of that. Now, this paper has a lot of findings, including uh, different descent between these two communities. However, the one thing they had in common, patrilineality and patrilocality. First, before we even get to the DNA, we notice that in these communities, the men are generally buried with a lot more bling, more stuff, more grave goods in of our burials, whereas the women tend to be buried more modestly. Now this suggests, although it definitely doesn't prove a potential status differential between the sexes. And let me start by just saying how jealous I am. This study alone comprises 722 of our genomes. That's nearly three times as many as are published for early medieval Britain, where, where I live. And this means that the author can observe a lot of the family dynamics directly from the genomes they have, rather than draw second order inferences using fancy stats like we had to in Iron Age Britain. So they come out with these family trees from both sites, Lobesdorf and Modling, and also do the same exercise uh, regarding Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA diversity. And it was pretty much opposite day versus what we saw in Iron Age Britain. We had a lot of mitochondrial DNA diversity, uh, a lot of continuity within Y chromosome DNA. So diversity on the female side, not on the male side. We had, a, uh, to the extent there were people buried at the cemeteries who didn't have relatives there, they were women. And we had very few adult females who lived at the same site as their parents did. What's more, at one site, Lebesdorf, there were 14 instances of someone having offspring with multiple partners, but 10 of these were men, providing some uh, evidence for polygamy, which of course those supposedly biased uh, accounts at the time did claim for the Avars. I'm not a play, I just crush a lot. However, what I'd like to see to better assess the potential polygamy is how old these men were when they died. You see, if a man died at that time in relative old age and he had uh, offspring with multiple women, if one of those women died very young, it's possible she just died in childbirth and then he married someone else. Uh, after all, uh, at that day and age, death and childbirth was pretty common. So that speaks to just a man remarrying, not polygamy. Anyway, the other site, Mudling, showed something even more conclusive. There, there were 31 people who had offspring with multiple partners, but this broke down pretty evenly between the sexes, 16 males, 15 females. However, these women mostly reproduced with males who were closely related. And this speaks to a tradition of leveret marriage, 
That's a custom whereby a widow marries a relative of her deceased husband. That's hot. That's hot. That's hot. Now, though the paper does not assert this, I have two observations. First, this suggests not a particularly high status of women. Uh, we know they're buried with fewer grave goods, and they seem to be passed around male relatives, you know, almost like property. So a lower status is, is what I see implied there, but definitely not proven. Secondly, just like what we saw in Iron Age Britain, this seems to be a good strategy for a warlike society. If a woman's husband dies, she will be taken care of. And likewise for the men, uh, they have a wife at the ready. No need to go through the trouble and uncertainty of uh, importing one from far away. Are you a mail order bride who paid for you? You're suspicious. So what we may have here are two societies employing very different strategies to essentially deal with the same problem, insecurity and uncertainty in a dangerous world. In the Avar scenario, we have what looks like a very traditionally patrilocal and patrilineal male-dominated society. However, in the Iron Age British example, we have what seems to be a matrilocal and matrilineal society, more of a girl power scenario. So the moral of the story, culture is complex and different societies and cultures respond differently to circumstances. While there may be sort of constants in human history, there actually is quite a bit more heterogeneity than you might think. And also these incredible insights come to you via ancient DNA. There's only gonna be more and more of that, so stay tuned. Hey, if you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you wanna support more independent archeology span content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.